Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first virtual event in our, seri in our series, The Science of Endometriosis. Today's topic is titled Endometrios Endometriosis 101 Clinical Studies. My name is Dan Darling, and I'm the Communications Officer for the MIT Department of Biological Engineering. Uh, I expect this to be a lively uh, discussion today, uh, so let's get to it. I'm going to introduce our speakers. Uh, Stacy Mismer is a professor of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive biology at Michigan State University, adjunct professor in epidemiology at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and lecturer in pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. She is scientific director of the Boston Center for Endometriosis and is president-elect of the World Endometriosis Society. An, endomet an endometriosis patient herself, Stacy has focused much of her research on identifying factors that affect the risk for and consequences of endometriosis across the life course. Hello, Stacy. Uh, uh, next, Linda Griffith is MIT's School of Engineering Teaching Innovation Professor of Biological Engineering and Mechanical Engineering and a McVicker Fellow. She co-founded and directs the Center for Gynepathology Research she is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, Radcliffe Fellowship, and several awards from professional societies. She serves on the advisory board of the Society for Women's Health Research. Linda also has endometriosis, and her personal experiences have inspired much of the groundbreaking research she and her colleagues are doing into this disease. Uh, let me quickly describe our format. Uh, our format will be question and answer. And we'll start with some pre-submitted questions. Um, and then we will, uh, we will look to the Zoom question and answer for your questions. However, um, a few things. We, we really uh, aren't able to answer individual clinical questions today uh, or uh, recommendations for treatments. And also, uh, we have a very short amount of time. So if we are unable to answer your question, it's not because it's it's, it's not without value or well-written or anything like that. It's just that we, we probably won't have enough time. So um, panelists, um, what is a clinical study and how does it differ from a clinical trial, including selecting participants? So, hi, I'm Linda Griffith. Before I answer that question, just a little bit of perspective. So thank you um, for that question. I'm here with you from one of my labs at MIT. And here in my lab at MIT, we actually study the tissues of patients uh, in, in our various clinical studies and interact with Dr. Mismer on occasion to analyze tissues from patients that she studies. So we have a lot of equipment in the lab. We actually, behind me, have a custom-made 3D printer that we're using to construct, reconstruct endometriosis lesions in the lab. We build very sophisticated devices to let us circulate fluid through these little lesion mimics that we get from patients. So there's um, a lot of um, interplay and in different kinds of studies we want to talk about today. Um, and if there's background ambient noise, uh, I hope you can still hear me. I think you'll be able to hear me. So as, as um, Mr. Darling mentioned, I actually am a patient myself and I um, got diagnosed in 1988 and I've been in pain for a long time. And I had a lot of questions about why research was so slow. As a patient, I tried to read the clinical literature. I, I knew nothing about clinical research, um, but I really tried. So this, this whole endeavor is to try to engage with you to help you get questions answered on what we're studying, why we do it and how we do it and why things are so slow. So to get started with what is a clinical study and how does it differ from a clinical trial, I think it's useful to, um, to answer a big overarching question that's really important for any patients who get involved in studies. A reason that we, um, Dr. Misper and I decided to do this education program was when the New York Times uh, published a story about our lab's work with endometriosis and my own experience, and then Terry Gross on Fresh Air had an interview, I got hundreds, hundreds of emails from patients that were very touching to me, describing their clinical situations, many of them very unusual, and, um, and suggesting that I contact them to get their, their tissues for studies that we're doing in the lab. You should really study me. I got that um, 
that uh, suggestion hundreds of times from patients. And so um, it occurred to me that many patients don't yet understand how they can get involved in studies because there's a lot of fundamental infrastructure and logistical issues. So we, Stacy, we can go to that first slide. So I really want to talk to you just very briefly about some important mechanics of clinical studies, no matter what kind of study or trial or anything it is, um, there's something called, uh, we, we want to protect the patient. So there's a lot of legal regulations around how studies are done. Um, Dan, is Stacy able to share her screen? It seems okay. like. Oh, hold on. It's an issue on my end. Keep talking. Okay. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of, um, a lot of planning, obviously, many, many things go into planning a study. There's the science, there's the money, how we get people to work. But a really important thing that's a first step. So we plan a study, we figure out what we want to ask questions about, we figure about what kind of patients we need, we figure out what kinds of things we want to ask them and find out about their clinical situation. We may collect samples um, of tissues and blood and bring it back to the lab. But anything that we do to study patients or to intervene and try to treat them in a trial must be reviewed by something called an internal review board. And this is a group of people, at least five people with different kinds of experience, including people who aren't scientists who would look at this from the patient perspective. So every single study or trial is brought to an institutional review board who looks very, very carefully at the study design and asks questions about what benefits will ultimately come to patients down the line from the study or the trial. Is it ethical? Is it safe? And so on. So there's um, this uh, whole process started in 1974 by the federal government around issues that had come up in protecting patients in clinical studies. Some of you may have read The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, a, an excellent book I highly recommend. We use it in our ethics teaching and I was actually a scientific reviewer for it. Um, and in that book, Henrietta Lacks uh, was treated well before the federal government um, had these kinds of rules and her tissues were collected without her consent. However, they are something called discarded tissues. So when you're um, going in and you have a hysterectomy, that is considered discarded tissue. And so you still must consent for us to use it in studies. Um, so it's very, very important that any study we do is approved by one of these boards. And they exist at every institution because I'm an investigator at MIT. So MIT cares a lot about what I'm going to be doing and what my students are doing. Stacy is at Michigan State University and at Brigham and Women's. Each of those institutions also has a separate board that reviews the proposed work that will go on at that institution. So this process is very meticulous and careful. So it can take a long time, three to six months and sometimes 12 months and sometimes even longer as you go around and around to get it just perfect. So when you go in for treatment, surgery or um, any kind of study, you will be consented. You will be explained risk benefit. You will be um, uh, told what the study is about, et cetera. And this is to protect you and make sure that all patients are protected. So when we get um, requests to be part of our study from people in another state, so people in Kansas, for example, wrote me, um, it's not possible for us to, to take those tissues unless the institution has a process to collect them and MIT can approve us to get them as part of the study. So it's generally not possible for someone at another institution to donate their tissue. Um, and this is why we recommend that people who want to be part of our studies um, go for treatment at the institutions where we have the IRB approval. So that's just a little background so that you understand that it's not that we don't think you're important, but rather that um, we are 
all um, collectively as a society and professionals really trying to do what's in the best interest of the patient and protect the patients. And so any questions about that, we, you can put into the chat and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about a couple of different kinds of studies today. There are studies where there are interventions. For example, um, Dr. Mismer will describe a diet study. Um, and then there are studies uh, where of the kind we do in my lab, where we take samples, and I show here peritoneal fluid. This is actually what it looks like in the operating room when we go to collect samples. There's a little camera that goes inside of you. If you've had surgery, you've probably maybe seen some of these pictures, and we collect that fluid. And almost always, if it's an endometriosis patient, there will be blood in it. So you can see that that fluid there labeled peritoneal fluid is a little bloody. So we collect samples. Then there has to be a way that we process the samples, tissue bank. The patients have a lot of data collected and Dr. Misner will talk about that. Then samples come back to my lab and this may be just molecules. So the fluid itself, we may just measure a bunch of molecules in it, but there could be cells and we may want to study them while they're alive and put them in an incubator and keep them for a long time. And so we'll measure certain things about these. And this involves um, laboratory personnel who um, carry out very detailed experiments. And then I'm at MIT and engineering. And a big thing we do is lots of kinds of mathematical analysis. Um, Dr. Mismer does as well, mainly epidemiology. We do a lot of, um, different kinds of mathematical and engineering analysis. Sometimes we build whole models of your lesions from tissues we collect using microfluidic devices. And then we come up with some kinds of predictions about what might be happening in patients. And we try to go test them. And for example, in a study I'll describe, we came up with an idea that a particular enzyme that no one had thought about as being involved in the inflammation was involved and we showed that it, it was by taking new patient samples and doing tests. So, um, so all of this process involves multiple, multiple little details and steps with very precisely written down rules for how to do everything. That, and these rules have to be followed very, very carefully so that we get the kind of data that can be shared and we know is correct. Um, so, so that's an, an overview of uh, studies in general. And what I'd like to do is turn it over to Dr. Mismer, because what she's going to do is take you through some, um, some uh, ways that uh, she thinks about studies and, and, and selects patients for studies and different kinds of studies and some of the, the considerations in how patients might be included or, or told that they can't be included in a study, even if they want to. Excellent. So thank you, Dr. Griffith. So as, as Dr. Griffith described, there are many steps that happen in, in the lab and conceptualizing a study that now has samples involved. We had shared with you all um, Dr. Griffith's study um, with uh, Michael Besty and that team. Uh, we wanted to highlight this trial study as an example of, of what Dr. Griffith is, is describing. So in a trial study, we are starting with a specific intent around um, an exposure for a population. And so in, we can start with a, a population where we're just collecting samples and data and looking, applying those complex mathematical approaches to see how um, the, the uh, cells and molecules and um, biologic pathways interact with exposures and, and lifestyle factors, age and, and different things of the patient current treatments. In a trial, we are, are still collecting information and data from patients and participants, but we're answering a very specific question and we're defining how they're exposed. So in this trial that we shared with you, that was focused on supplementation of, of dietary um, nutrients in adolescents with endometriosis, our main questions were, among adolescents with endometriosis, could fish oil or vitamin D decrease pain, improve quality of life, and decrease use of pain-related medications? And where this is pertinent to that idea of trial versus study versus clinical study is that 
all studies have very clear inclusion and exclusion criteria. And what this means again is under this IRB approval, it's very much predefined. So for this study, we were focusing on adolescents. So our participants could only be 12 to 25 years old. They had to have a previous surgical diagnosis of endometriosis, and they had to currently be experiencing pain. And there's a, quite a few different ways that we define pain, but we had to, to confirm that they were not having successful, completely successful treatment of their endometriosis related pain. For this specific study, we had inclusion exclusion criteria, meaning that we couldn't include patients who already had an illness that could affect absorption of nutrients. So if we're testing vitamin D, testing fish oil, they can't have a condition that would impact how their body processes those nutrients. We also needed to make sure that since we were going to be giving them vitamin D, that we couldn't um, be pushing them into toxic levels of vitamin D. So one of the things the IRB was very specific about was making sure we knew what their vitamin D levels were before they started. And they also couldn't have anything that could perhaps be affected by these nutrients such as pregnancy or kidney stones. Now, one last point on this question that, we, that Dr. Griffith and I really want to make is that for all studies, where we're meeting the patient, where we are describing the biology, where we are describing the treatment impact, where we're, they, we are describing the symptoms varies a lot. And each area is important in and of itself, but affects how we can interpret our results. So for example, are we capturing patients very early on in their symptom onset? Are we capturing them after they have really been struggling for diagnoses or undergone many treatments already that, aren't, that haven't been successful? Are we focusing on an age where now they're starting to have additional morbidities um, such as uh, irritable bowel or um, celiac disease or other autoimmune conditions? And where they are in their life course is really important to define and that also is part of our IRB definition. I will throw back to Mr. Darling. Right. Um, so uh, panelists, how is a clinical study planned and, and, and how is it carried out? Excellent. So, so I'm going, oh, no, go ahead. As Stacey, as Stacey is going to put up some, she's got, we've got a few slides because we did have some questions in advance, but I'm thrilled to see that there are some questions showing up in the Q&A um, box. And so we are hoping to get to these. Um, and it's, so if you've got questions, things come up, go ahead and put them up in the Q&A box. We'll get through some material and then we'll come to the questions that you, you, you have. And it's really great to see those coming in. So please feel free, anything you wanna ask, um, we will do our best to uh, go through the questions that are um, coming in. Excellent, excellent. So really briefly, still staying with that trial example. As we're planning and working through a study, we're thinking very specifically, again, through all of those IRB approved steps of what are we measuring? In a trial, we are defining what these exposures will be. So in, in this particular nutrient trial, we needed to make sure that all of the participants and those of us, the scientists and clinicians involved in the study, that we did not know, no one knew, what the different participants were going to be taking, whether they were taking fish oil or vitamin D or a placebo, meaning that they actually weren't taking any of these nutrients at all. Everyone received pills that were what we call enrobed. They were in these gel capsules. So we did a lot of testing in the beginning of how small we could make the capsule to fit the nutrients that we needed. In the end, we ended up needing two pills to get the right dose of fish oil and one pill of vitamin D. So those who were taking vitamin D ended up with one pill that was vitamin D and one that was placebo to get the right dose. But all of these steps are really critical in thinking about how we're going to run the study, but also we have to be really clear that this is what we're testing. We're not testing other elements in, in this study and being very specific about those decisions early on. These patients also, completed a lot of questionnaire-based questions that are very rigorously designed. 
and validated to capture how are we defining pain? How will we know if there's change over time? How will we try to capture differences among patients? And so in the planning and running of these studies, um, there's a lot of effort. We have large teams um, that we're funding and training that are receiving the questionnaires. They're collecting the samples, sometimes in clinic. Our team receives some of our samples, urine and saliva through the mail. Um, we then are processing them in the lab. Um, Mackenzie Godwin is, is the, um, the head of our day-to-day um, -day research assistant team who are running these things. And we also collect samples that we store over time so that we can go back and use them for additional studies. So specifically in this trial, we wanted to make sure that we could follow patients over a six month time period and then collect, collect and compare among these different treatments. And in the end, what we observed over the six months was actually from the placebo group, the vitamin D group and the fish oil group everyone approved a bit over time. And in fact, the placebo group and the vitamin D group had almost identical improvements. And one of the things we really then ask is, what could be happening in this placebo group? What is it about having participated in the trial that did have long-term um, beneficial effects that were similar to those who received the supplements? And why are there differences in the groups? And so Dr. Griffith is focusing a lot in her lab and her work around that heterogeneity of groups. And I'll pass on to, to Linda to add a few, few thoughts about that for this question. Sorry, I muted when he came in the lab a moment ago. Um, so we're starting to get some really great questions. And I think we'll maybe try to weave answers into some of these uh, as we're going. Some are easier to answer in the context of this discussion, and we might leave some till later. So it may not be in chronological order. So um, getting to Stacy's uh, point, and I think we can call each other Stacy and Linda because we work together for a long time now <laughs> and uh, are both really um, excited to be working together because Stacy. Um, does these kinds of epidemiological intervention studies with patients on diet and um, other things. And we study things in the lab. So what really, really intrigued me when I came into the field were exactly findings like what she just showed. And Stacey, if you go back to that last slide, I want to point something out, which is if you look at the error bars on there, you see that she's got a little yeah. dot in the middle, which is an, some kind of average and then huge error bars. And in fact, among the patients at each of those time points, when they looked at them, their patients that, you know, may have declined a lot. Some patients may have done very well on the diet and some patients may have not had a response, but then they're all averaged together. So yeah. one really, really interesting question to me is, can we, and Stacey, you can go forward, can we start to think about classifying subsets of patients? Because we all know individuals who've had, um, had uh, good responses to a particular diet or you know, maybe you don't eat dairy and you don't eat soy and that's great. And other people avoid caffeine, all of these things, but something that works for one person doesn't work for another. And we also know that in certain diseases like cancer, for example, um, we know that it's not one disease. I got breast cancer right after I started working on endometriosis, which is um, about a dozen years ago. And what was astounding to me was immediately within less than a week of when I found the tumor myself, I had results saying I was triple negative. They did three markers, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2, and I was negative for all three. And those markers are related to the prognosis and to the therapy. And they're related to both of those things because they're part of the mechanism of the disease. We've studied breast cancer so much and other kinds of cancers, we know about mutations that happen in those cells that drive the disease. So I had a very, very powerful chemotherapy because there are no targeted therapies for triple negative. So we started thinking, can we start to bring that kind of molecular classification to endometriosis patients? So maybe in Stacy's groups, 
there would be subsets for whom the diet would be really effective. And you know that's probably true, Stacey. You know some of your diet people who got better, maybe it was due to the diet. And how do we sort those out? So can we go back, and you can go back to the slides now. And, and the thing is, in endometriosis, it's sort of like um, some other chronic diseases like arthritis, there's not really molecular mutations. So getting to the genetics, Stacy studies the genetics, there's not mutations in the cells, um, DNA, there's some changes that can happen. So what we decided to do, I'm showing you here a study that we did. So this is where we took samples from patients. And what I'm showing in the picture is just a schematic. You've got um, the uterus and you have a little picture here of the endometrium where you see um, some a depiction of cells and I don't have a pointer here, but, but it's in that little circle. Stacey, if you can point no, to, the, to the uterus part, you can see the red cells, that's your cell, the endometrial cells, and then they have other cell types, immune cells are the white ones, yellow ones make the support structures. And so that's inside the uterus. And then a very, uh, a lot of circumstantial evidence suggests that in some patients, not all, but there's evidence to suggest that some of this tissue can go through the fallopian tubes and land inside the peritoneal cavity. So we show the lesion here. Well, in your peritoneal cavity, peritoneum means your abdomen. So there's a lining, a very um, slick lining so that your organs don't stick together called the peritoneum. There's fluid and I'm showing there's pictures um, in the middle, there's cells and they're immune cells. And it's just like if you get an infection, like if you get um, a pimple, you get all these white cells in the pimple, right? So an endometriosis lesion has some features of like a pimple because you can get immune cells and blood vessels, it hurts. Um, but in the fluid, there's also immune cells and they're making a lot of, of proteins that cause this pain and inflammation. And so we decided, well, maybe there's groups of patients that have different kinds of immunology compared to other groups of patients. So what we did, and this gets um, a refrain of what Stacy described, we decided to study patients in a practice at Newton Wellesley with Dr. Isaacson. And these are all patients having surgery for endometriosis. So they um, or they're having surgery for something else like fibroids, infertility testing, and so on. So the controls don't have endometriosis. Then we had endometriosis patients who were um, uh, taking no hormones. So they weren't on birth control pills. They weren't on Lupron. And then there were some patients, only a few of them who were taking some kind of hormone therapy and we wanted to compare them. And so we wanted to ask questions about whether there might be molecular classes of patients that we could get by studying a whole bunch of these proteins in the patients. And, and so the reason we wanted to study a whole bunch of proteins and not just one gets back to exactly that problem I told you about on that graph that Stacy showed, there's like this huge error bars. And so you see here, we're measuring here one protein and I'm showing you the problem. This is to show you a problem measuring one protein. It's something called interleukin-8. It's something that regulates immune cell function. And we're looking at it plotted for the patients who don't have endometriosis and then the endometriosis patients who either aren't taking hormones or who are. And we're plotting the amount. And, and this is an unusual plot because it's something called a log scale. So there's every um, number you see there, there's a tenfold variation. So what, what you're seeing is that in the untreated patients, some of those patients have sort of a normal level, right? They look just like the controls, while other patients have a whole huge level of this. And so it didn't matter if we did it by treatment status, severity of, of staging or cycle phase. There weren't, you always saw among the endometriosis patients, um, a lot of scatter in the data. So this said to us, these patients probably have different kinds of disease. So instead of measuring one molecule, and we can't really tell much because it's just one molecule, we actually measured 50. And we then asked, how are these changing 
uh, together, and then we could separate patients into molecular subgroups. Okay, so why was this important? It was the first paper where anybody tried to say there may be molecules that will classify the patients. Those molecules may be related to the kind of inflammation those patients have. So it was a step and it really opened people's eyes to thinking that you could do this. Now, why, why don't we have a classification scheme yet? Because we need a lot more patients to validate these models. We need patients of many different ethnicities, many different, we need to figure out the ages, that younger patients and older patients um, should probably not be grouped together. So this was a first step. We showed that it could potentially work, that there were differences, but we need much bigger groups of patients classified by clinical stratification, ages of the patients, um, and various other things to really hone down and con connect the molecular classifications to, um, to, to what might be varying in the patient. So these are um, the steps. Um, there's some great pertinent questions here. So for example, yeah. there's an attendee who's asked in cases of in vitro models, are all patients or donors good candidates to study the disease? And what is the criteria? And so I'll, I'll just make a comment and then, and then we'll let Dr. Griffith talk about that quite a bit. That, um, for example, Dr. Griffith referred to those treated versus untreated patients. And so sometimes we select patients and we select the use of what um, biologic samples to include based on whether we know they've been exposed to hormones or exposed to anti-inflammatory drugs or other things recently. Sometimes we deliberately choose those and sometimes we, we deliberately don't. And it depends a lot on what um, how we're defining what question we're trying to answer and how, what we know already about biology or what we're just trying to tease apart for new discovery. Um, yeah, I, I want to elaborate on that. Um, yep. And again, we're thrilled. We're getting a lot of great questions and I think we'll be going through them. We'll have time to go through most of them. So the in vitro models, there's two stages of building the in vitro models. In the first stage, we have to figure out how to build a model from just anybody, okay? So it's very hard to do that. Our lab had to invent a whole lot of new tools, um, biomaterials, microfluidic devices. And these are tools that people in other diseases now want to use. They, we invented them for endometriosis. And now people who study the intestine, who study Crohn's disease, want to use these tools. So we had to invent those. And that took years. It took 10 years. And we had to find unusual places to get funding to pay for this, like the Defense Department. So first, there's the stage where we can use just a couple of patients as test cases just for how do we do this. And there, it's not super critical what the properties of the patient are. But then we get to a stage where we say, okay, the model, it seems like we know how to build it. Now, we want to take certain kinds of lesions. We want to take cells from a deep infiltrating lesion and compare them to a peritoneal lesion and compare them to the utopic tissue. So there we may say, okay, we, we want to compare patient to, you know, four patients who are below the age of 21 to four patients who are over the age of 35, because we think there's differences in the way that older cells and younger cells will behave. So there's, there's a lot of different facets. It all starts with how do you define an interesting question that captures aspects of the clinical situation that we think may be important in differentiating patient groups so that we can get to better personalized medicine. So it's all about, have we defined the clinical phenotypes, the kinds of things that Stacy does so beautifully, have we defined those um, clearly enough that we could compare this person versus this person in the in vitro model. Absolutely. There's one other question in the chat that I think is pertinent here, which is um, a participant has asked, if my daughter's asked to consent to be part of a study, what are her risks and what will happen to the tissue? So again, I wanna come back to um, this, the, the issue of risk is very specific to what is being asked of the participant. This has to be clearly not only stated, but conveyed in the consenting process and discussed very clearly and openly and precisely. We have some studies. So for example, one of the papers that we shared with you all 
um, the DeVosta study, that is a totally what we call an observational study, which means that participants go through their um, normal clinical care. We don't assign um, exposures. We don't assign the care that they're receiving. We collect a lot of information via questionnaires. And so one of the things that's important in terms of risk is being sure that the studies that you agree to be part of have clear confidentiality and protection of your information. So for example, in our studies, we can never link the answers that participants give us in the detailed, um, uh, uh, very generous sharing of their lives and experiences. We can never link what they tell us with their individual names or any of their contact information. They're always kept completely separate um, and we, we never connect the two. Um, also in terms of the samples, uh, it, the question of risk also comes up of, for example, we collect blood samples, but we collect them when they're already being collected in the clinical setting. So it's not an additional blood stick, but some studies collect additional blood. We collect urine, there really isn't a risk for that. For the tissue studies that Dr. Griffith leads, they're collecting from already scheduled surgeries. And so there isn't an additional um, uh, risk of harm from those studies. But then when the tissue comes to, to her lab and the team is using it, it will have been laid out in the consenting process whether that tissue is being used for a very specific study or sometimes we ask participants to consent to let us use the tissue for anything related to endometriosis discovery, for example. And again, we keep people's individual identifiers and identification completely separate. So that's not a risk, but you, you may be asked to contribute for a yet still to be designed question. What else would you add to that, Linda? Yeah, I think the only thing we think about a lot is there are some very, with all the new technologies coming out for sequencing, it's very inexpensive to sequence somebody's DNA. There are very specific consent um, procedures if we're going to sequence your DNA because you you could theoretically be identified if we publish the sequence information. So we don't do that in our, uh, or if we were to make induced pluripotent stem cells from you because we could theoretically, if we got um, an IPS line from you, we could clone you. So, so that is completely, theoretically. Yeah. It, it, th <laughs> these are things that are very, very, very um, explicitly described. Um, we don't do them in our studies uh, that we get from patients. So, you know, maybe someday in the future, but these are things that other people may ask you to do if you're in a study. Um, so I, I think, uh, we I have, have a question. Yep. Go ahead, Dan. <laughs> um, so, uh, it's an important question. Uh, who pays, uh, for these studies? Excellent. Excellent question. So let me also share, this will be, I think the last time that I'm going to bounce out to share a screen with you all, which is that. There are many sources for funding these studies. So for example, um, there are governmental grant awards that fund these studies. The main fun funding source in the US is the National Institutes of Health, NIH. There's also the Department of Defense has large, um, many people don't realize that they have large um, biologic and health discovery um, funding programs. There's also foundations. So I've just listed two here, Endometriosis Foundation of America, World Endometriosis Research Foundation tends to have um, small grant opportunities. Also, many of us are institutions. So mine of Michigan State, Harvard School of Public Health, our institutions will have internal grants, MIT certainly does. But whether we're looking at different elements in the biologic process, whether we're looking at characteristics and outcomes, whether we're looking at exposures of treatments or other environmental um, and life exposures, a lot of what we do actually goes unfunded and it is capitalizing on other resources. So I know there was a, a question in the Q&A about genetic studies, and, and this is a good place to point out that this is a map of a very large endometriosis-focused genetic collaboration that um, my friend and colleague, Karina Zondervan leads. I'm the, the US lead, Grant Montgomery in Australia is, is the Australian lead. Um, and all of that is uh, currently 
uh, basically volunteered time and volunteered information that's being pulled in from 26 sites across the globe. The key thing with genetic studies is you need hundreds of thousands of participant data to come to answers. And as uh, Dr. Griffith said, this is one of the key places for confidentiality that we only look at data in aggregate. So we sum across hundreds and thousands of people so that we're not looking at the genetic makeup of any one individual. And those studies take huge amounts of resources. One really, really important point, remembering that NIH is the primary source for resources for um, discovery within the US is that, let me, oh, hold on, there we go. So this is just a graphic from 2020 of, it's actually data from 2019 of charting the NIH funding by what's called a DALIA, Disability Adjusted Life Year. This is a metric of the burden of disease, the mortality, the morbidity, the, the disease burden and cost of any disease. And you can plot any disease here by how much funding it receives. And so very simplistically, those conditions above this line are adequately funded for the amount of burden. Those below are not adequately, fun adequately funded. And as you can see here circled in green, this is endometriosis. So well below this adequately funded line. And so just to give an example of one of the studies that we shared and have been talking about a bit today, for our SAGE trial, we, it is very difficult to get funding for those types of studies, especially when you're trying to test a novel hypothesis. And so we actually had small pockets of money from our institution at Brigham and Women's Hospital and from two, a, a um, professional society and a McCarthy Family Foundation award that all cobbled together to make that happen. And then Dr. Griffith as well for their study. Linda, if you want to talk a little bit about what your paths are to to yeah, this was well. this was a foundation, and we wrote up a, a little proposal. They'd never funded any gynecology, but they were they really realized ten percent of women have this, so they gave us money to start the center at MIT and and connect with others. And I think um, this is probably a good time to answer the first question we got in the Q and A. Um, so it's an anonymous attendee. Congratulations on being successfully treated, and it sounds like you're doing well. From I infer from um, your both surgery and your therapy and. To the point that you um, raise about mental health counseling and mental health professionals in women with endometriosis and studies, I resonate extremely strongly with your, um, your experience that mental health support is important. Um, endometriosis requires often many health professionals, and this is one of the problems. Often you have a surgeon who just wants to do surgery or an endocrinologist or whatever, and and, and things are siloed. We're starting to see more individual centers start, starting to evolve. I know that Dr. Isaacson, who I work with, has pain and pelvic floor. There's many, many different facets of this that are starting to be more integrated in the care of patients, um, perhaps more so in Europe. They are actually starting to have um, what they call centers of excellence in Europe and the mental health component, I think is very strong there. But to, to get your point, I don't know of the specific studies because there's very so little funding for endometriosis in particular. The funding has that I'm aware of is going towards some of these more, um, more basic studies, uh, trying to quantify the molecular and cellular properties of the disease and correlate it with the clinical properties. So I personally am trying to advocate, and one of the reasons to have this is to have people like you help us convince Congress that we need more funding that integrates the care of endometriosis patients and the study of endometriosis across many institutes at NIH. So I love this question and I love that you shared your experience because I, I think that patients are often, you know, we also know that a lot of the hormone therapies that are given to patients can cause depression. I myself became suicidal when I was on a particular therapy to the point I actually went and almost bought a gun. And I realized I sort of had an out-of-body experience realizing 
that it was the drugs doing this to me. So the depression is real. The suicidal tendencies I know for me were real. So I, I think there is a huge role and I don't think it's being studied as much as it should. So keep pushing for that. You had a great experience, get out there, share your experience. I'd be happy to talk to you offline about how you could help. Well, I'd like to add that, you know, the, the, that I could not agree with Ms. Linda more. I also could not agree more strongly with the appreciating the, the, the person who posted this uh, question and opened this particularly up for discussion that another area that's so important is um, not only funding focus, but attention to endometriosis and its associated symptoms from multiple disciplines. So this is not ever just about gynecology. It is not right. ever just about the uterus. It is about, um, you know, we are increasing collaborations with, uh, with pain management specialists many of whom have never thought about chronic pelvic pain um, and the pathways and with um, psychological and psychiatric interventions. I too had an extremely terrible side effect from my first drug treatments and became very depressed and had difficulty um, uh, when I was in my early 20s. And so this, this is something very real and both, you know, Dr. Griffith and I has been blessed to be humans who have had a path that has um, improved for us. That's not true for everyone. So access to care, multidisciplinary teams is absolutely how we have to be pushing forward. Yeah. So, so for example, um, I know that in one of um, Stacey Missner's studies, she found that pediatric patients have a lot more gastrointestinal symptoms than older patients. And it's one of the first manifestations. I know it was for me when I was a teenager, my niece, et cetera. So I, I actually, endometriosis is only about a third of what I do in my professional life. So I obviously I teach and I teach physical chemistry and all kinds of engineering things at MIT and have grad students, but I actually also work in liver and gut uh, models and thinking about how we can study those diseases. And I just wrote a big Crohn's disease grant with pediatric gastroenterologists at MGH. And part of that is getting, working with them and saying, you know, there's a lot of your patients who don't have Crohn's, they have endometriosis. So trying to get these other health professionals to even think about endometriosis, especially in the younger pediatric populations. And that isn't to say for those of you who are like us, me and Stacy, older, we don't care, we care about you. We're just thinking about the whole life cycle and where we can look at targeted interventions. Um, so, uh, so, so these are there. I think Stacey, it'd be really great to talk a little bit about genetics because that's a huge topic. And, Absolutely. Um, and so if you could, because you're, Stacey's one of the premier uh, people involved in studying the genetics of endometriosis. So maybe you could say a couple of things about that. Absolutely. We referred to this a little bit in terms of confidentiality and, and large sample sizes and things, but really didn't address the key question, which was, are there genetic drivers? So we know that um, uh, girls and women with family members who have chronic pelvic pain, who have, who specifically have endometriosis are more likely to as well. And a little bit in terms of endometriosis that gets complicated by the difficulty people have with getting an accurate diagnosis. So if a member of your family had successfully achieved a successful and an accurate diagnosis, you may be more likely as a family member to also be able to access that um, a healthy, more straightforward path to diagnosis than unfortunately most girls and women experience across the world. So there's a little bit of bias there, but we know from twin studies um, and several studies, again, led by some of these really leading groups in, originally in Australia and in the UK, um, there is absolutely an inherited component. There's absolutely a genetic effect. The, the twin study suggests that about 50% of the risk of endometriosis is inherited. However, across all genetic studies, but this is very true for endometriosis, despite getting larger and larger numbers in our study, studies and more accurate and accurate estimates of the genes that are involved, there's really two clear answers. One is that this is absolutely not a one or two gene driven disease. This is a complex disease and therefore has many genes that come into play. 
um, related to endometriosis. We now have in that really large study I was describing, we've identified 44 different genes that appear to play some role. But even with identifying that larger number of genes, we're still only explaining about 7% of what's driving who does and who does not have endometriosis. So we have a lot that's still unknown. Some well, of that may come into what's called epigenetics, which is the, the everyone has their genetic code, but there is a, a, a biologic difference in what genes are turned, oversimplifying, but what genes are turned on and off through processes called methylation. Um, and those turning on and off of genes and affecting the action of the genes in what's called the transcriptome that go from genes to ultimately the proteins and the outcomes, that changes at different points in your life. So and environmental exposure. Exactly, and environmental exposure. So you were one of the ones who looked at dioxin. And exactly, so right. There's, there's, there's a lot of potential for all of these things in the environment that are stressors. Right. And including if your mother got exposed when she was pregnant with you, if she got an infection. And we, we're, tr you know, people try to study these in animal models and uh, really do controlled studies in animals and then extrapolate and see, you know, people like Stacy try to say, can we study this in actual populations, which is really, exactly. really hard. Um, exactly. So these are, these are some of the ways um, we're doing. We're getting close to the end of the hour. So we I are, it goes so fast. A couple of things. Um, yeah, I, I think we're getting close to the end of the hour. So we will try to maybe take one more, but I want to mention just a couple of things. This is an experiment. We're trying to help patients and other people who want to help us create a community that understands the process of research, how we could make research go faster. So some of these questions about can you get involved, just email us. I'm very easy to find on the internet. So email us and we can correspond with you separately. We also would like some feedback and we'll be sending you a little, um, a little questionnaire because we didn't really advertise this very strongly because we just wanted to do a trial run and see if it would work. Things like there's so much noise in my lab. Can we even have me broadcast from the lab? I learned today. Um, and MIT is of course just emerging from COVID. So just a lot of the things that we take for granted with the staff are, are not so easy. So, so we, we would be interested, should we try to do this um, once a month, uh, take topics, you know, various topics, because you know, this takes us a lot of time to prepare, but we're also very frustrated um, at how slow the research is, honestly. We are frustrated. We would love to have more patients uh, being involved because when you get involved, then we can start to push for the whole, you know, bureaucracy, Congress and everything to understand that we need the infrastructure to do better research and also to help the patients. Um, and, you know, the, uh, as a population scientist and, and, and clinical scientist and, and Linda from her engineering and um, uh, physical chemistry and molecular biology lens, all of this comes together in what we know for certain is no two people are the same and that a treatment that works for most doesn't work for all and a treatment that doesn't work for most will work for some. And it is our, we spend most of our time thinking about how to answer those questions, but they're impossible to answer without the unique and important experience of the individuals who give very generously of their time, of their samples, of, of their, their personal information to, uh, for us to start to tease out this complexity. So I wanna take one last question. Some, someone has asked, where do I go to find the most, um, the most recent findings related to endometriosis trials and study resources, where can I get resources and support? So there's a lot of places to find this. And unfortunately there's not like one giant summary. We, um, you know, there are organizations like the Endometriosis Foundation of America that has a newsletter that often sends out summaries of recent studies. Um, the primary sources, of course, are published papers that are on PubMed. Um, one of the things we wanted to do today is give you a sense of how studies are done 
and we didn't really go through a whole lot of papers, but maybe we could do that in the future because a lot of the studies are really pilot studies with very small numbers. For example, the study that we published, which now it made other people think about this is a really important approach. So it made the whole community think to do this. But in that first study, we couldn't solve the problem. So I think what's hard as a patient is to understand what's the difference between a pilot study that had a small N and a larger study that may actually have clinically act, clinical implications for you. And to a certain extent, there are aggregators of endometriosis news that will send out lay summaries of those and Endometriosis Foundation of America is one. But for trials, you can go look on clinicaltrials.gov Every clinical trial is on there registered and any publication related to the trial will be added there. Unfortunately, a lot of things never get published. The oh, clinic, right. clinic, um, clinical trial on, um, on June kinase inhibitors, for example, never got published. So, so it can be very frustrating and hard as a patient. It's even hard as a scientist for me sometimes. And I do this professionally to find the most relevant information. I have to really go looking for it even as a scientist and I know how to look efficiently. So one of the things we wanna do is with this whole process is to start to create a community where we can help you try to find these things and have a conversation with people who are in the trenches like you trying to figure things out. Um, so there's a lot of uh, to unpack here. We won't have time. Um, making noise with government, it's a double-edged sword. You can actually, by making certain kinds of noise, do worse things. I think sign up for our news list for one thing, but write your write to your representative. It write If you write to your representatives and to your senators, that they, they will get this and you can write to them and say that you know that endometriosis and gynecology don't get a lot of funding. And we may be able to provide, uh, Stacy and I could discuss this. There's actually some interesting studies that NIH has done that, that get to some of this. And, and I think uh, there, there may be some ways. So stay tuned because we don't have a perfect answer for you today, but I think a start is just writing your representatives because when they hear from people and get all your friends, your family, get everybody you know to write, and then they, they see a whole bunch of stuff and they'll start paying attention to it. All right, so we are at the five o'clock hour. Um, uh, any last comments from our panelists? Thank Final you thoughts? everyone, just thanks to everyone who took their Sunday afternoon and um, listened to us and, and, and asked some great questions and shared some of their experiences. Absolutely. Indeed, and, and to, thanks to our panelists as well, uh, Professor Linda Griffith and Dr. Stacey Mismer. Um, this has been a great afternoon. Um, I'm going to be sending out a feedback form to everyone who attended mm -hmm. today. Uh, so please take uh, the three minutes to fill it out and, and tell us how great the event was. But more importantly, tell us what we can do next time to make yeah. it even better for you. And share, um, share our, our email list with anyone you think would be interested. Our goal is really, we have a long view. We really want to help patients. That's all we want to do. We suffered. We don't want anybody to suffer. So figuring it out together, patients can really help us figure out how to do this. So this is an experiment. We'd love your feedback. Talk to you and, later. Um, and, and visit our uh, cgr.mit.edu. I'll put that um, in the chat right now real fast. Um, and I think... It's time to say goodbye. Okay. Uh, Bye, everyone. Thank you again for, for participating. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Linda, for your leadership.